guess we'll see. Okay. Um, I'm recording now. Is does the audio still sound okay? Yeah. Yeah, okay. it does. Yep. It sounds fine. Okay, great. Thank you guys. Um, all right. So we're talking about video game genres. Um and genre is uh kind of a you know fancy term. Um you probably heard it in your English class. Um and it really just stands it means like a category. Um so we use genres in a lot of different contexts uh for literature, for film, um, for uh also you know art, different things. So we'll look a little bit about the term genre and where it sort of comes from and how we use it um when we're talking about different types of media. Uh and then we'll talk about how it specifically applies to games. And it will be touching on um, a lot of the concepts that we've already looked at, especially the idea of interaction and how that's very specific to games as a medium and as, a, as uh, different genres within the medium. Um, so for a quick definition, genre um, uh, began as an absolute classification system for ancient Greek literature, uh, poetry, Prose and performance had specific and uh, calculated or uh, formulaic styles that related to uh, the theme of the story. Um, so that's kind of where the concept comes from. It's applied in a lot of in a broad sense uh, these days. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard the term before uh, in a lot of your classes, whether it's you know as I mentioned English or art history or dif different things like that. Um, and it's the way that we categorize uh, art and other types of media, um, and it creates certain expectations. So if you go to watch a horror movie, there's certain expectations that you have for what is gonna be involved in that experience. And you know it helps us as viewers um, consider what type of different things we like and what kind of things that we want to uh, participate in or view. Um, and it also helps us as game designers or authors of, uh, of our uh, art or our work in terms of knowing what the expectations of an audience are and then either using those expectations or playing with those expectations. Um, and so we'll see how that relates to games. Um, we can talk about a few different uh, mediums first and you know talk a little bit about the differences. Um, so, uh, one thing to note is that genre is um, more kind of like a suggestion. It's not like an absolute, even though uh, in the quote it says it's absolute. Um, it's not really absolute. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of art criticism and film criticism and stuff like that is kind of like arguing about whether something is one genre or another, or what the importance of genre is. So um, it's not there. You know, it's they're not rules that are um, sort of uh, you know you can't break, um, but there's more kind of like guidelines that are useful ways of describing the characteristics of a work of art. Um, so we'll look at some traditional mediums and then look at games. So we can start with literature. Uh, you know, this is pretty uh, basic, but uh, in literature, we have a couple different forms, prose and poetry. And this comes from that uh, ancient Greek tradition, as well as other traditions um, from different areas of the world. And the basic genres are epic, tragedy, and comedy. Um, again, this comes from the different types of, uh, of Greek literature. Um, so we also have a lot of subgenres in, liter in literature, uh, especially in fiction. Um, some of the subgenres are drama, fables, fantasy, uh, fiction, um, which includes novels and short stories, folklore, historical fiction, horror, humor, mystery, mythology, poetry, realism, science fiction. There's all these different subgenres within these kind of major genres. Um, in terms of nonfiction, uh, there's autobiography, biography, essay, narrative nonfiction, nonfiction, and speech. Um, and you'll notice that the genres have to do with, uh, you know, what our expectation for the plot is going to be. Um, whereas our subgenres, uh, some of them have to do with the form, like whether it's a short uh, piece of writing or a long piece of writing. Um, if it takes place in a, a specific uh, era, uh, you know, if there are certain there's certain rules, like for nonfiction, um, autobiography, uh, you know, has to be based on truth. 
Um, whereas an essay or uh, you know a novel doesn't necessarily have to involve uh, truth or reporting or things like that. Um, when it comes to the basic genres in literature, um, they're really influential as far as how we think about other things because obviously we had uh, literature, um, especially performance uh, and poetry before we had other things. So, you know, when film came along, they borrowed from novels and poems and short stories to create plots for the film. And when uh, visual art came along, um, it did the same thing. When video games came along, they borrowed from everything that came before it. So most mediums and uh, artistic works are influenced by uh, what the author or the creators, you know, enjoyed when they were reading or watching movies or playing games, things like that. Um, and so we'll see these kind of like three basic genres in a lot of different places, like the epic, uh, you know, involves a hero going through a series of uh, trials or obstacles in order to, you know, reach a goal. Um, a tragedy uh, typically in involves a tragic flaw and some sort of reversal or um, acknowledgement. Uh, and a comedy, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be funny. A comedy means that, you know, things turn out good in the end. Um, so these are a few different forms and we see how those kind of are used in lots of different mediums. Um, for creating different works of art. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, literary genre at first is based on the style of the writing. So prose versus poetry. Poetry meaning that, uh, you know, sometimes the words rhyme, there's a specific meter. Um, usually that comes from a, 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 a tradition of singing or uh, rehearsing the poetry. Um, and then prose, there's not as much attention paid to the uh, the sound quality of the writing or, you know, things like rhyming and meter and things like that. Um, more attention is paid just to the structure and the argument of, uh, of the writing. So then um, literary genres are also based on historical periods. Uh, so when a specific work was made. So you might refer to, um, you know, uh, modernism or postmodernism, like eras when certain types of writing were very popular or new innovations in writing occurred. Uh, so genre can refer to sort of uh, intrinsic qualities of a work, like just what, how it's written, what it sounds like, but it can also refer to uh, contextual qualities of work, like who wrote it, like what period of time, if they belong to a specific school of writers, um, things like that. So again, it's very, you know, there's a lot of different factors uh, when it comes to how we think about genre. Um, so talking about film a little bit, um, the basic genres in film are action, adventure, comedy, crime, drama, epic, historical, horror, musical, dance, science fiction, war, western. So these things have to do with the plot, like what we expect from the plot, and also the setting uh, has a big influence on the genre of a film. And that makes sense. If you think about how film works, you have to make a film, like you have to actually film stuff in a location. And so that location is always going to exist physically. We're not just describing it uh, with with uh, poetry or uh, with writing. And so the visual component where we are, if we're you know inside or outside, what people are wearing, what type of technology is visible, all of those things are going to influence the genre. So um, setting is very important for film and the plot is also very important for film. A film tends to be very formulaic, like it has a, a most films are pretty similar in length and they usually tell a pretty similar story. Um, so the link to the main film genres with a little bit more detail. So again, film genres reflect the setting, the theme and the plot. Um, and most films kind of combine different genres. Um, some films are also categorized by the auteur system, which is like how we think about uh, film directors. Um, so, you know, with, with novels or poetry, there's usually a single author. And so we think of, you know, a collection of works like, you know, the plays of Shakespeare or, uh, you know, the novels of Hemingway or something like that. Um, in film, most films require like lots of people, like dozens of people to make. You have people holding the cameras, you have people who make the sets and people who design the costumes, 
Of course, you have the actors, the directors, cinematographers. So it's a little more similar to making a game. You have all these different people who are responsible for very specific components of the film. And so the categorization uh, or authorship is a little bit less clear. Usually it's like the director of the film, but you know sometimes you think about it as a writer, like one person might write a bunch of different films that are are directed by different directors. Sometimes it's also the producers. Like if you watch the Oscars, the people who are going to accept the rewards are a lot of the time they're the producers, the people who, um, you know, maybe put forward the money to make the film or, uh, you know, had the had the basic idea and then they hired the writer and the director and things like that. Um, so an example of this is just Hitchcock. Like, you know, Hitchcock was a very famous film director. He probably wrote most of his movies or adapted the scripts and he probably produced a lot of his movies as well. So we have this specific idea of what a Hitchcock film is like. And video games are very much like this. We usually have, there's there's very few like famous video game designers. Like there's a few of them, obviously. Um, you guys can probably think of some. Um, but most video games are created by big studios and you might not know, you could watch the credits, but you may not know who wrote the, the video game or designed the levels or designed the characters. You may associate the game more with a studio that produced the game. Um, so quickly talking about art. Um, art is more categorized by medium and then historical movement. Um, so again, these are all just sort of like broad general categorizations. They're not uh, sort of like hard, um, absolute categorizations, uh, but it's interesting to think about the way that they're different and how the mediums are different. So in art, we have, you know, these very different basic mediums that are, that, uh, are, are part of visual art. So things like drawings, paintings, printmaking, sculpture, collage, textile, photography, film, video, performance, and multimedia. And these things actually have to do with the tools that are made to use them and the technology. Like you make a drawing with a pencil or a pen or charcoal or something like that versus painting where you need a canvas, you need uh, different types of paint, you need paint brushes. So this is really has to do with the technology that's used. And then that technology often has a sort of noticeable difference that of what we see. So if we see something that is made with a uh, pencil, we'll usually think of it as a drawing versus something that's made with paint or ink. We might think of it as a painting or a print or uh, you know something that's 3D, we'll think of as a sculpture. And this also happens in video games a bit. If we have a 3D video game, we're gonna think about it as a certain type of game versus a 2D game, um, something that's on your phone versus something that's on your computer or in VR or something like that. So games kind of involve this, this type of categorization as well. Um, there's also periods in art, similar to in film history or literary history. Uh, there's also different types of genres like history painting, portrait painting, landscape painting, still life painting. Um, so there's a few different ways of categorizing uh, what we see in visual art. All right, so uh, we don't need to spend a ton of time there because we're not making any of those genres. What we're focus, uh, focused on is video games. And so what we'll see with video games, uh, when we look at the main genres, action, adventure, role-playing, simulation, strategy, casual, and uh, MMO, um, these obviously aren't every single video game genre, but this is a pretty good list of the kind of basics. We'll see that uh, with video games, the difference has to do with the mechanics, the way that we interact with the game. So not so much what platform it was made on or where the set setting is or uh, what part of history it came from, but what is the user doing in the video game is usually more of a determiner of what the genre is. Um, and so this is a quote from one of the articles in the research section, uh, sorting out the genre muddle by Ernest Adams. Um, it's a good article just to think about these things and you know when you're starting to create a game, what kind of genre you might want to make it in. Um, and so Ernest Adams writes, video game genres are determined by gameplay, what challenges face the player and what actions he takes to overcome those challenges. So we clearly have sports games, shooter games, racing games, and so on. Um, and so, you know, in, within these genres, like if we think about like maybe simulation as an example, a simulation game could take place in a lot of different settings, a lot of different time periods. Um, all sorts of different components that we might think of as the genre, but the main genre in terms of its, you know, its categorization as a video game is still simulation. 
um, you know, we're simulating some sort of uh, real world history or event or process or something like that. Um, so the gameplay is what sets the genre in video games. Um, so thinking about the qualities of the different genres, so starting with action, uh, action tends to describe early simple arcade games um, and they emphasize timing and hand-eye coordination. So if you think about like Space Invaders or Pong or Mario, these are all good examples of action games where the gameplay has to do with your actual physical ability to play the game. Timing, uh, you know, jumping at the right point, moving the Pong paddle into the right uh, position. So it challenges our hand-eye coordination, um, our feedback between what we see on the screen and what we input through the um, keyboard or mouse or joystick or, uh, you know, arcade buttons or gamepad, whatever it is that we're playing with. Um, and then timing, uh, timing these events uh, to match what we see on the screen. Um, Real-time gameplay is a component of that. So, uh, you know, we don't, we don't get to pause between uh, decisions like we do in chess um, or strategy games. We have to, you know, time our decisions and make our decisions in time as the game is playing. Um, uh, <laughs> typically, I have the spelling error here. Uh, I need to fix that. Uh, Destroying the enemies without dying is often the objective of an action game, although not always. Um, so Pong is a good example of this. Um, you can see the really early interface for Pong. There's like barely anything on the screen. Uh, it's a local two player, so you have two controllers. And you're the only thing that you control is the position of the paddle. Um, but that's enough. Uh, just that little bit of input is enough to create this challenge between the two players. Uh, Miss Pac-Man is another popular arcade game. You can see that um, it's also a local two-player, although I think you can play against the computer in this one. Um, and uh, it has you know, many of the same qualities where we have uh, a few buttons that we can make choices with, but we're playing in real time. So we have to um, use hand-eye coordination to uh, react to what we see on the screen uh, using our input. Um, so some action subgenres, platformers, uh, shooters, racing, fighting. Um, and so you guys can probably think of examples of all these different types of games um, and, you know, how they're similar or different. So platformers, um, you know, if we see platforms, we are going to think of certain components of what makes a platformer fun. You have to run and jump and time your jumps and uh, solve uh, platformer puzzles, like how do I get from one place to another? Um, and a lot of games that might not at first seem like a platformer, you might suddenly realize like you are actually doing a platformer. So um, a good example of that might be like Portal, where uh, it feels like a first person shooter because you have the portal gun. But at a certain point, you realize what you're really doing is solving uh, a puzzle based on, you know, moving between different platforms. So um, a lot of uh, action games will use these different genre conventions um, or, you know, combine them into, into complex experiences. Um, shooters, first person and third person, these are very popular. So um, obviously a lot of people play these types of games. Racing games, uh, fighting games like um, uh, 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 Street Fighter and things like that are all part of the action subgenre. Um, so Mario obviously is action, uh, you know, real-time gameplay, involves platforms, involves hand-eye coordination. Um, so moving on to the next one, adventure. So a lot of adventure games are early text-based games. Um, and so adventure games have more to do with narrative. Uh, it might just be exploring. There may be some puzzles or some riddles that have to be solved. Um, so the slower gameplay, you don't have to make immediate decisions or immediate reactions to what's happening on the screen. You have time to think about uh, you know, how to solve a puzzle or um, which direction you want to go within a story. Uh, typically, they're turn-based. So you get to do a turn, and then the computer or another player gets to do a turn. Um, Rogue is an example of an early adventure game. I'll talk a little bit about this uh, at the end in terms of um, this sort of new video game type genre. Um, action adventure. So this combines real-time gameplay 
with story and puzzle elements. Uh, Role-playing games. Um, so there's a little crossover here, but uh, role-playing games um, originate from the game Dungeons and Dragons, which you guys are probably familiar with. Uh, it's a, a game where you kind of create a story through different decisions and you uh, control different characters and you have different people who um, input different decisions into that system. Um, players control a character or a group of characters, often an avatar of the real player and you gain experience throughout the game. So this is something that comes from role-playing games that's used in pretty much every game is that you kind of level up throughout the game. So the more you play the game, uh, the more rewards you get, the more experience you have, uh, and the, you know, the more uh, sort of uh, levels you'll be able to go through, um, you'll be able to uh, complete more of the game um, and have, uh, you know, better, better components or better rewards or you know other things. So you gain experience as you go through the game, you level up. Um, typically we have like full storylines. So there's a lot of attention paid to narrative. Um, Final Fantasy is obviously a good example of a role-playing game um, where you have a bunch of different characters and they have different abilities and different histories and uh, roles in the story. Simulation games, uh, as we talked about a bit, are replicating aspects of the real world experience. Uh, these tend to be real time and turn based games, um, applying real world rules. So, you know, real world uh, physics or histories or um, different things like that. Uh, so, Flight Simulator is a really popular example of a pretty sim simple simulation game. Its goal is to be as realistic as possible. So, obviously, it, can't completely recreate every component of what it's like flying an airplane, um, but its goal is to, uh, you know, recreate as much of that real life experience as as it can within the video game context. So we have vehicle and uh, flight sims, um, process and construction and management, like building civilizations, uh, strategy games or business games, so like Roller Coaster Tycoon or games like that. Sports simulation is another big genre with FIFA and Madden and uh, other sports style games. Another genre is strategy. Uh, based on classic games like Risk, um, these are, you know, involve resource management, uh, decisions and goals. These tend to be turn-based as well um, and uh, not real-time. Uh, so Warcraft, early, the early versions of Warcraft are a good example of this, where you kind of build out your cities and uh, you know, farm and create your armies and stuff like that. And then you might go try to conquer another part of the map. And massively multiplayer online. This is uh, you know, relatively new, although it's not really that new anymore. Um, this is different because it involves lots and lots of individual players. And so it does something that most other types of games are not able to do. Um, it can be played individually or in teams, and it involves a lot of social interaction. So you're talking to the people that you're playing with. You might be interacting socially with the people that you're playing against. And these are commonly combined with other genres, like a first-person shooter, a sports game, a strategy game. EVE Online is an example of an early uh, massively multiplayer online where you have this like really big world and lots of different users can uh, group together to form uh, groups that can interact with each other or fight against each other or um, create different strategies within the game world. Another uh, genre of games is casual games. Um, this is actually, casual games is where uh, I had my first uh, jobs as a game developer, um, making Flash games. Uh, I feel like you guys probably know what Flash is, although um, there aren't a lot of, Flash got discontinued, so people aren't really working in Flash anymore, and it's kind of been a while since it was popular, but when I first got out of college, that's what I was doing. I was making uh, you know, these little web-based Flash games that you could play pretty casually, just solving puzzles or doing things like that in your browser. Um, so casual games tend to be short and relaxing or meditative. They're not really intended for, uh, you know, a high level of challenge or skill. 
Um, and they're not really meant, you know, they usually don't really tell a story. Um, they don't have like a long experience. It's more something like uh, Tetris or Minesweeper, something that you would use to kill time or to relax. Um, you can play these on the browser, on your phone. Uh, mobile games was a huge, huge new market for casual games. So people playing uh, like uh, Candy Crush on their phone on the way to work, things like that. Um, casual games tend to involve puzzles, um, maybe card games, word games, board games. Um, Diner Dash is a good example of this where it involves other things like strategy, resource management, and things like that. But, you know, it has a cartoonish style. It's not meant to be uh, you you have like one basic thing that you're doing, which is uh, trying to, you know, seat people at a diner and get food and serve them and sort of manage all these different things that are happening. And so um, it's more of a casual experience of a game. Um, and so the last one that I want to talk about, which is uh, the roguelike genre, this is uh, a an interesting genre because I think it's a little bit different than the other genres in the sense that it's uh, it's very specific to video games. It came from one specific video game and it spawned what's a pretty popular genre today, as well as mechanics that are borrowed by a lot of other types of games. Um, so roguelike games, uh, and this link goes to um, just the Wikipedia for roguelike, um, are games that uh, emerge from a game called Rogue um, that was first published in 1980. Uh, and what is interesting about Rogue was it's made by two developers. They were working at a college, so they weren't uh, working in a uh, corporation or a company that was trying to make money. And they were doing this, um, you know, just kind of as a hobby project. And it was inspired by early text-based adventure games and interactive fiction. And what Rogue uh, kind of did was it solved this problem, which was that, um, you know, if you wanted to create a game that one person could play, that was engaging, you had to have a lot of levels. You had to have, you know, maybe 20 levels or 30 levels. And building those levels took a long time, but it also took up a lot of uh, data on the computer. And in 1980, um, computers couldn't hold a lot of data and it was especially hard to transfer data across the uh, early versions of the internet. Um, and so in order to make a game that you could actually distribute to people across the internet, not through like a physical, uh, interface like a arcade cabinet or uh, Atari console or something like that. If you wanted to send something across the internet, it had to be really, really small. And so they solved both of these issues uh, by creating procedurally generated content. So instead of actually designing all the levels of the rogue, what they did is create rules for how a level could be designed. And then they set up the game to be randomly generated every time it was played. So every time you play rogue, you'll get a different set of levels. Um, and so they could make a very small code base that could generate an infinite number of different experiences. Um, and so uh, Rogue, the game has very simple graphics. It's based on the uh, these sort of principles of an adventure game, like you collect different items and you kind of uh, gain experience. And so you can have better weapons and better armor and you fight against uh, uh, different monsters that have different attributes and you have to kind of strategize for whether you want to have, uh, you know, higher level of uh, magic spells versus armor versus weapons, all these different things. And so there's a lot of complexity that goes into the game, but the graphics are incredibly simple. Um, and so it was a very small program that was easy to, uh, to distribute. And so all of these different types of characteristics uh, have become you know of this popular subgenre called a roguelike and lots of games borrow roguelike elements uh, especially the procedural generation which is generating content um, from an algorithm rather than from you know making every single component of the game uh, by hand um, so uh, roguelikes are good for uh, small developers especially individual developers if you want to make a game that has a lot of levels but you don't have you know 10 level designers and 20 artists and different people to work on it you can instead make rules that define how the levels are built and then focus your time on that um, and there's a lot of there's a big community around roguelike type games um, this is a wiki called rogue basin that has lots of articles uh, and uh, different 
uh, resources for creating roguelike games. So it's it's very cool resource uh, for roguelikes. Um, so yeah, uh, I think that's the last slide. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about Rogue uh, in a couple different settings, but um, it's a cool game. If you haven't played it, um, I would recommend checking it out. I think you can play it online. But you can also download it uh, if you have a DOS box. Um, so you can emulate uh, window, the old DOS operating system. Uh, but you can play it on here, I think. Let's see. Yeah, this is emulating DOSBox. Um, and so it's just like a text-based game. Like when I started, it just looks like this. And you can see I'm the little smiley face and that K is a monster that's coming after me. And I think this thing is some gold. And so I can fight the monster and I can walk around and collect different stuff. And it's a really simple game, but it's actually a lot of fun. It's very complex. And it also has, uh, if you die, you're just dead. You have to start over from scratch. So it's, it's a, it can be a pretty intense game. You have to get through like 26 levels uh, to win. So uh, it's pretty fun. I would check it out um, if you're interested. Um, but yeah, I'm, that's genre. So I'm gonna stop the recording and see if there's any questions and then uh, we'll continue from there.